three, Here two, we are. one, come. Hello, everybody. So I need to look up there, yeah, right? Because that's where everybody's at. And can everybody hear me? That's one of the first things we need to check out. I know people will be joining. Uh, oh, and I see a thumbs up. They can hear you, Jerry. So it sounds like they can hear me. And that's good. <laughs> Y'all get to hear the man tonight. <laughs> Oh, and Rinspire, Rinda can see and hear me too. Wonderful. Hi, guys. Welcome to the live broadcast. My name is Jerry Wise. I'm a uh, life and relationship coach, and I've been helping people with relationships for the last 40 years. And I'm very glad to uh, be here tonight and be able to do a live broadcast. I just realized I have the wrong glasses on, so I'm going to have to get the right ones. Hold on. Okay, now we're back, and I got the right glasses on, so I should be able to see better now, and I'll be see what notes I have. Uh, I have a number of interesting questions tonight from folks, and I'd like to answer some questions. Uh, if you have questions tonight, uh, thank you, Rinda, my extra smart glasses, I have to have those on. Uh, because, boy, I tell you, I need extra smart glasses. Um, the uh, We have some good questions that I want to field this evening. I also want to talk about uh, emotional circuit breakers also. And uh, Mark's going to be joining me here in just a minute to get your questions if you would like to write in with questions, please hold off on your questions right now until Mark gets in here in a while, and I'll tell you when we're ready for questions. And then be sure to identify the question uh, with the capital question uh, that you use, put a capital question, and then write a short question so they can be answered. Sometimes if they're paragraphs after paragraphs, uh, then we get into doing a whole coaching session, a whole counseling session, a whole, uh, and and we just can't do that in a 90-minute broadcast, or we wouldn't be able to get through very many questions. Also, um, the other thing is uh, many people, many questions that people write are um, not. Uh, they are really answered uh, and could be answered over a series of sessions because, believe it or not, um, uh, people don't always realize they're not ready for the answer yet. And I think that's one of the things that we find in maturity and growth. Uh, and in my own growth, in my own maturity, um, I have discovered that um, I remember when I first started studying family systems, or I can even tell you the first time I was asked a systems question. Uh, I was a pastor at the time, and I was feeling depressed and didn't know what to do with myself, didn't know what to do with my church, went to the seminary that I was going to, to my supervisor, who was a psychologist, 
and a Lutheran pastor and uh, an expert on family systems, which I did not know. I just knew whenever he gave his lectures, um, whenever he gave his lectures, I couldn't get enough of it. I wanted him to just keep talking because I thought, how does he know what he knows? Because I don't know how you know what he knows. I, I was really confused and I wanted to find out. Well, he ended, he's ended up being my supervisor. So I went in talking to him about my struggles and problems. And um, I remember I felt down and he simply asked, Jerry, what role does your depression play in your church? And that was the first systems question I think I was ever asked. And I thought, what a very strange question he would ask me. Why wouldn't he ask me, how am I doing with my depression? And have I thought about getting help for my depression? Which is, he would have. I mean, he would have had no trouble. But I think he was diagnosing that it was some something more systems connected. And so I began to think. And he said, well, you know, Jerry, if I waved a magic wand and you didn't feel depressed, what would you do? So I kind of imagined and fantasized that I'm not depressed. I'm totally happy. I feel confident. What would I be doing? And then it scared me to pieces. And I said, that's why I'm depressed. So I won't go do these things that would be scary. Um, and that was to confront certain individuals, to take a stand on certain positions, to be clearer about myself, to not worry about what other people thought. I mean, I just saw a whole parade of uh, horribles that would be happening as a result of um, me not being depressed. And he said, well, if I were you, then I would probably stay depressed a while longer, which he says tongue in cheek, but not totally playfully or facetiously, because he's saying that um, that um, depression that you have is serving you as well as hurting you. It's doing both. And so we have to recognize there's both sides to that. And so I began to learn more about family systems thinking. And, um, and so that was my beginning of kind of fa understanding family systems. And I said, I don't know what books you've been reading, Dr. Stoneberg, but I want to know what they are. <laughs> Where would I start reading? And then I began to read and study. And gosh, that was back in, gosh, late 80s, something like that. Um, and I began to kind of get healing even in the earlier 80s. Uh, but I really got uh, a big boost at that time. Um, so uh, that's looking at a systems approach. And I've been looking at systems ever since. Not that I don't think people can have a biological depression. They certainly can. Biochemical depression. I'm sure Dr. Stoneberg felt the same way. But there are systems dynamics. And so if you begin to deal with those systems dynamics, you know, do you really have depression? Or does your depression play a role in the family, in the marriage, in the church, at work, you know, in any system that you're a part of? Uh, because it does play a part. Our mental health does play a part in those things. Um, I, uh, I want to talk about tonight, we're going to have uh, kind of as a theme that I've been working on, which is uh, how to reduce your emotional reactivity and understanding circuit breaker living and understanding emotional circuit breakers. Uh, because we need those, um, just like, for example, I'll use the example of me being depressed and the church. 
what was happening was the church and I were was doing a were doing a loop, and it was very much a multi-dimensional uh, systems or a mobile, and so everybody's pinging and affecting everybody, and so. Um, there were many people who wanted me to function in leadership this way and that way and that way and this way. I was not solid. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know um, what I really uh, wanted or needed and what I thought was important. I, haven't, I hadn't been clear about myself. And so I became a victim of all the system dynamics that were going on. And unconsciously, the best part, the way I could play my part in the keeping the homeostasis or the equilibrium of the church was to play a depressed role. Then that didn't disrupt the church or it didn't disrupt other people or it didn't challenge other people. Now, it made me feel bad. It also cost the church in some other ways, but but it still was an equalizer. It was an equilibrianizer. Uh, you know, it kept the equilibrium uh, in the church uh, so that it could kind of function without change. Because if I stopped being depressed, the church would then be troubled by change. And the church didn't want troubling by change. The church wanted me to just stay the way I always had been. Uh, and that was, and it was more, again, this is generally an unconscious process. But you know, one of the things about a circuit breaker, once you take those unconscious processes and look for them and see them in a systems way, then you begin to experience a circuit breaker. In other words, all that's coming at you from the family, from the church, from the organization, it breaks a circuit and you're now not being pulverized by that circuit that's going through everybody, that emotional field, as we call it. And so once Dr. Stoberg helped me see that, what was happening then a natural circuit breaker starts to happen because I've now just reframed, which is another natural circuit breaker, if you reframe things, uh, just like we've used that analogy of the Coca-Cola, once you reframe somebody's irrationality and craziness to Coca-Cola, well, now the force or polarity of that electric current or emotional current doesn't go run through me anymore. It stops at the circuit breaker where I have flipped to a reframing. And so I began to see the church in a new way and reframed way. Also read the great book, Generation to Generation by Edwin Friedman, uh, which was superb. Uh, definitely saved my life as a pastor. Uh, could save anybody who's in leadership organization, because he talks about synagogues, churches, the workplace. You see, everything's a family. If, you're, if you have a family system's perspective, everything's a family. What's not a family? Uh, the golf set of the six of you go play golf is a family. Uh, the, you know, the girls night out, that's a family. We, we all function with the way we function because that's how we function. You know, that's us. And we bring that to every system we have, every relationship system. So it doesn't matter whether it's work or, um, uh, you know, work, church, uh, a family. Uh, it's, uh, they're all systems. So any organization is a family. And, uh, you know, where two or three are gathered, says the Bible, is a family. That's my editing of the scripture. And, um, and so the family will begin to operate. Uh, and however I function in the family is how I'm going to function and how I was functioning in the church because that's how I was functioning in my own family. And so I was just bringing that to the church and didn't see that. Once you begin to open your eyes to seeing a more... Uh, 
uh, what is it, 30,000 foot view, ceiling view, that begins to change and the circuit breaker begins to happen. And then what happens in the family, the church, at work, doesn't run through you as much as um, it, it doesn't run through you like it did before. You are no longer just the victim of the emotional field of this system, which may be very dysfunctional. Um, and you're no longer just, uh, what do I want to say, a victim of it and, and just a puppet of it, an emotional puppet. Because now I can begin to go, okay, now he said, Dr. Stoneberg said these things. Huh, he's right. Well, the way he put it, I have choices. Ooh, now they may not be easy choices. They may be hard choices because they were. If I, if I decided I was not going to be depressed, then I would start doing these things. I would confront this couple or talk to this person and say that I don't, that's not going to work for us. We need to go this direction. I needed to be more differentiated. And um, so um, that I wasn't jumping up and down that I should be doing all those things. But what was nice is Dr. Stoneberg never said I should do them. He just showed me if you do this, you'll do these things. If you do that, you'll do those things. And, and it's not like, okay, if I don't do all these things, then I'll be happy because I wasn't happy by not doing all those things. So then you choose, and forgive the analogy, you choose your poison. Because it's going to be troubling either way. Well, let's at least choose the trouble that's going to move us in a better direction and might provide some relief down the road, because sometimes we have to be patient, but at least move in that direction. And so I, he never once shamed me, shooted me, or said, you got to do this. In fact, if anything, he said, slow down, be careful, don't change too quickly which is an excellent, wise thing to do that he did for me. Uh, because that's one of the things you want to do if someone is caught in a predicament. You Many times we try to struggle and pull them out. Sometimes a circuit breaker can be even saying, no, slow down. I think you're moving too fast. When they're going, I want to change now. I'm ready to change. I want to change now. No, no, I want you to slow down. And if they can choose to slow down, it begins to create a circuit breaker for them, even though it's not giving them what they think they want. Because not always what we think we want is healthy or systems healthy. It's just individual viewed healthy, not systems healthy. And um, so, um, so I began to do some of those things and made those changes in the church and began to make some moves in that way. And it did create a stir. There was some resistance, but it was the best choices I could ever make. It, it was superb, uh, me making those kinds of choices. Um, and I saw the fruit of that down the road. Much fruit came from that. Uh, so there was definitely some benefit. I come out of depression. The church starts heading in a healthier, better way. And we have more clarity uh, in the whole organization. That's pretty worthwhile, uh, though it wasn't easy. Now, again, that's if you're in a leadership position, you can have quite a bit of influence on an organization. We have a little less so if we're just a member of the organization. But it doesn't mean we have no significance because I work with a lot of people to change their own roles in their workplace. They may not be the president of the company. They may not be the supervisor. But they can work better to be uh, strategic and to be more themselves in the system. And that can actually uh, reduce toxicity, uh, how people uh, scapegoat them, 
how they get caught up in toxicity uh, and a lot of things in that regard, if we look from a systems perspective. Um, I also want to talk tonight about, uh, we'll talk about a couple and what they had learned about circuit breakers. Um, in fact, and what's so, I think I had, and I'm not sure where I put it. Let me look here. Let's see if I wrote it. Damn. Oh, I don't see that. Um, I had made some notes. They were kind of quick notes, but I'm, I'm sure we'll probably hit on many of these things tonight. So I hope the example of the depression in the church was of help to you uh, to kind of look at how we look at problems in a systems way. And I always want to look at what's going on in a systems way. Now, it may be individual, may, individualization may be the best way to look at something. Uh, but I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's ever unwise to look at a systems view of almost any problem. And in fact, Murray Bowen, uh, the grandfather of family therapy, looked at schizophrenia, which is about as stubborn as an illness can be. Uh, a break from reality, and he saw how much it affected the system and the system affected it because he worked with schizophrenics and their families. And uh, he began to see that, uh, wow, there's a lot more. How come when there's greater differentiation, greater autonomy, more clarity, the schizophrenic uh, patient is less psychotic? When the family is more enmeshed and dysfunctional, the schizophrenic patient is a lot more psychotic. And he's going, this is an illness of the brain. Why should the family have an effect on this? And that's when he began to realize because there's much more going on. There's a lot of electrical, emo when I say electrical, think emotional. Emotional current going through the entire family all the time. And so how you manage that, and we'll talk about some circuit breakers, how you manage that uh, is very important. Uh, let me, uh, there were, I got some questions before tonight. Uh, one of them is, uh, Dear Jerry, uh, my covert narcissistic sister is enraged by my newfound independence from my family of origin. We stopped talking a year ago because the relationship is not manageable on any level. I had very close relationships with her two kids. When my relationship dissolved with my sister, I realized my relationship with her kids felt one-sided. They are now 17 and 20 years old, still living at home, and very much under my sister's control. I haven't talked to them in over a year. I wanted them to contact me, but they never did. Now I feel guilty that I haven't called them. Recently, I texted and wished my niece a happy birthday. She responded that, it's nice of you to text me after a year, but thanks anyway. I can't make sense of relationships that dissolve once I stop being the old me. Then people are mad at me. They never called me. Thank you, Jay. I won't say her name. I'll just say Jay. Well, Jay, the, um, that one of the things we want to do is take your sister, her kids, your relationship with all of them and get up on the, the top of the ceiling and look down so that we can see what are the moving parts down here. And so we're coaching the team or the system up here rather than coaching from an eye-to-eye uh, eye level, which doesn't show you much about what's going on. You only see part of it if it's eye-to-eye. Um, and 
And then because if you look from up here, then maybe the question that you would ask, um, I can't make sense of relationships that dissolve once I stop being the old me, then are mad at me. Well, when, and I have several quotes on my Facebook page, and you might want to go to my Jerry Wise Relationship Systems Facebook page, and um, you'll see a bunch of quotes uh, about why self-differentiation or becoming the new you is not welcomed by a dysfunctional family because then you ping all of them and that sends a current through all of them that you are wanting to change the system and how we relate to one another. And that's very, very unfortunate. Um, and so they will resist that and give you lots of resistance. And so you should not be surprised that once you stop being the old me, people would be mad at you because the old you is what they're used to, what they want, and what is the homeostasis and equilibrium for the family. And you said, no, I don't want to do that. I want to have more independence. And they're all going, no, no, that runs afoul of our enmeshment. Stop doing that. And, uh, and so then, um, when my relationship dissolved with my sister, you're right, relationships that, are, that get dissolved take hostages. And unfortunately, in families, your sister then takes your, her children as hostages. Or your sister takes her children and convinces them to not leave the cult. And so that I don't want you talking with Jay. I don't want you talking with her. Uh, she's bad. She's not treating me right. She won't treat you right. I don't know why she's trying to hurt me. And so then we have that whole cultic mythology uh, or the, uh, what would it be, the ant um, uh, alienation. We have parental alienation, we have ant alienation, where we alienate us from her kids. And that's very unfortunate, but I think it can be helpful to look at it as a, it's, in other words, the kids are in a cult. And you even mentioned... Um, they are now 17 and 20 years old, still living at home and very much under my sister's control. Does that sound cult-like to you? You know, because a mature sister would say, well, Jay and I are not getting along right now. We're having a hard time. We have some disagreements. Um, but you kids have whatever relationship you're going to have with her. That's okay. That's not a cult. A cult is, let me tell you how bad your aunt is. And you don't want to have anything, any part of her. And you guys better do what I want you to do. Uh, and it can be unspoken. It's just you know if you don't do what mom does, says or wants, there's going to be heck to pay, just like probably Jay has had to pay because she didn't make her sister happy. And, and again, independence from a dysfunctional or enmeshed family is not welcomed. That is not a, you know, and so I just want to tell you about how the relationship system and the emotional current runs in families and that um, when you add independence or autonomy or differentiation, those words are all similar. When you add all of this, then you need to be ready for resistance and ready for unhappiness because 
you will threaten everybody. And it pings everybody and everybody's emotional uh, voltage will really go up if you start changing or have some uh, circuit breakers. Uh, and again, that's one of the things with a circuit breaker, though I'm not an electrician, but I assume you have a circuit breaker because there's a surge of electricity and we don't want it to go so high that it destroys the equipment or destroys the next transformer or pole or line or whatever. So the circuit breaker uh, drops just like in your house. Uh, if there's a surge or a problem, uh, then it wants to shut it off so that we maintain things. Well, that can cause, again, there, there's a problem of more emotional uh, voltage going on on the other side of that circuit breaker. And families get caught up in that emotional voltage. But your circuit breaker keeps you more insulated. Now, the difficulty is you won't be thanked for that because you're supposed to continue to be that that you're supposed to stay on the circuit so that we keep that high level emotional voltage going and smooth throughout the system, even though it's too high, even though it's dysfunctional, even though it's toxic, you need to help smooth it out. Well, if you step out of it, just think what we've done to everybody else. They're not going to thank you for that. And so we have to be willing to ride through the three stages of resistance. Uh, why are you doing this? Please stop doing this. And then stop doing this or else. And we want to go through all of those uh, stages of resistance before we might be able to find a new level of operating within this family where we can we are getting less voltage going to us. If they want to have high voltage, that's fine. But I don't. I want more calmness. Uh, I want less reactivity. Now, if they want to, that's okay. And if they come to accept the new me to some degree and are more neutral about it, then I can be a part of the family in a new way. Doesn't make the family all well, doesn't make it non-toxic. It just helps. It just makes it easier for me because they've come to accept, well, we just can't, uh, you know, drive Jerry crazy anymore. He's just neutral. He just, he just doesn't care. Well, after a while, okay, I'm the I don't care Jerry. That's fine. I'll be the I don't care Jerry. Just come to accept that it's an I don't care, Jerry. That I'm, I'm harmless as an I don't care, Jerry. And by the way, that's another circuit breaker. Being an I don't care person. You know, well, you're not being a good son. I don't care. I'm a bad son. That's okay. If, if that's the way I need to be seen. Looks like, oop, had a little focus problem there. Uh, if that's the way I need to be seen, that's fine. I'll embrace the bad, which is another circuit breaker. I'm going to, someone's not going to keep me caught in a guilt systemic uh, emotional voltage going through the line about you're not doing what you're supposed to do as a daughter or son or brother or husband or whatever you are, worker, church member, uh, that you're not being what you should be. Okay, then I accept um, that, uh, you know, I accept that uh, I'm not. So I embrace the bad and that provides a circuit break it for me and their uh, emotional current doesn't cause reactivity for me. And that's what I want. I don't want that reactivity. So embracing the bad can be another circuit breaker for us. Uh, I have uh, another question, and we'll we'll get to your questions here uh, in a minute. So I hope you'll be patient. 
Um, now, she didn't say I couldn't use her name. Let me make sure. Okay, I think I can. But I, you don't know who it is. So it's, this is Jenna from who knows where. Um, dear Jerry, thanks for your help and answers. I have a question for your next broadcast. Uh, my mom likes to pull me aside and inform me of things she sees are psychological issues for me that I need to address. I feel resentful when she... Let me write something down. I feel resentful when she does this, regardless of whether she might be correct. I'm not sure why it makes me so uncomfortable, but I dislike it. Is it appropriate to ask her to stop? Is there a clear way to do so? Well, I think your question has uh, the answer in it. It's certainly appropriate to ask her to stop, though she may not be pleased with your asking, and is there a clear way to do so? Certainly, you use your words and speak that to her. Now, I'm not being facetious and I'm not being funny. It's that, of course, both of those are true. But I think it would be more effective if we saw what was going on. And again, that's where the real circuit breaker happens, is we can if we can reframe and see what's going on with Jenna, your mom, and you intrusiveness and someone uh, calling out your life, someone giving you unsolicited advice, someone, I don't know how old you are, Jenna, you know, if you're 10 years old, that might be a little different. If you're 20 years old, that would be different. If you're 60 years old, and by my, by by the way, my mother could do that even if I was 60 years old. Uh, parents tend to, many times parents don't feel an obligation to grow up and to grow out of their parental role. They just feel entitled to it. So they, they don't feel an obligation to change that. In fact, they feel it's even good if they do that. And that's why they were put on earth. At, to be your eternal conscience, your eternal observer, your eternal criticizer, your your eternal I've got the best advice for you, er, uh, and and those kinds of things. Now, Mark uh, is going to be joining us here. He's getting his paperwork set up. If you have a question, write question in caps uh, so that we know it's just not a comment and then ask a brief uh, question. So what does Jenna do about her mom? Who's always telling her, hey, you've got these issues, you need to address those. I feel resentful when she does that, even though she might be correct. And again, that's what's even hard when someone might be right. But even though they're right, doesn't mean they're right. If someone comes to me and says, um, Jerry, uh, by the way, I have a Buick. And if they go, I just want to let you know, the Buick was not the number one safest car in the U.S. Uh, I don't know why you bought that one. Now, they may be correct. It may not be the safest car. It probably isn't. Um, but look at their right while wrong. Why is it their business? Why are they sharing that with me? Are they sharing that with me for altruistic reasons? Because they care about me, concerned about me? But yet, to some degree, it's like, I know there are probably safer cars. Uh, but I wanted this car. And I will drive safely uh, as best I can. Uh, and as far as I know, whatever car you buy, there is some risk. In a, in a, if a if a sixteen wheeler hits you, I'm not sure it matters too too much what you're in. Uh, now there are some 
cars that are more safety minded. And I do acknowledge that. Um, but there are also some very, very, very safe cars that I can't afford. So that's a problem too. So when someone offers unsolicited advice, and that's what we have here with mom, first thing you want to do is, uh, Jenna, one of the things you can look at is, well, is she right? Okay. Well, so what if she's right? She can be right. Uh, oh, you talked about your resentment. That's what you were concerned about. I feel resentful when she does this, even, even if she's correct. And I remember certainly feeling that way. Uh, I would feel resentful whether my mom or dad was right or whether they were wrong. I would feel resentful. Uh, and that would come up in me because it was the way I look at it. Again, if you take a 30,000 foot view and look down, it's your mom and using, and here's another circuit breaker that I use, which is the tennis net. If you're on one side of the tennis net, she's on the other side of the tennis net your mom, Jenna's on one side, your mom's on the other, Jenna. What happens is when mom makes these comments, she either takes down the net or jumps over on your side. That's why you feel resentful. That's when the resentfulness uh, comes up in there because it's it's just troubling. It, it would be like, you know, I, I probably would have been good if I'd have gotten a haircut for tonight because the lighting, you can see my scraggly hair at the top. And it's not all shaved back, which I generally tend to do, but I haven't had a chance to go to the barber. Now, if someone would just keep telling me about my hair over and over and over again, then I could begin to feel rather resentful or kind of upset about that. Like, why, you know, yeah, I know, I probably should get a haircut. But it's not going to hurt us tonight. I mean, I don't think anybody's going to have to shut the program down because my hair is a little scraggly up there. Almost maybe a Bernie Sanders look. I don't know. <laughs> though, though he has more hair than I do. I'll have to say that. He definitely has more hair than I do. Um, and so, uh, so you feel resentful. And again, what you, you have probably had mom who has done this since you were a small child more than likely. It's probably been going on for a long time. And you may not have done or embraced fully the negative feelings you felt about it. And that is also a circuit breaker too, when we can embrace the negative feelings that we feel about it, not and weaponize them and send them to mom. That will, that's not a circuit breaker. That's a circuit surger. So we don't want to surge with those negative. Um, uh, we we don't want to surge with those negative uh, traits, uh, negative feelings that we have. So, but we do need to embrace our negative feelings. So we go, oh, I do feel resentful about this. However, I need to go explore what I'm resentful about, and I need to go um, take a look at. Uh, how long I've had this resentment. Maybe I need to be working on that and write a letter, journal, and talk to somebody, a sponsor, a 12-step sponsor, coach, a therapist, and read this very resentful letter I have uh, towards mom, but not weaponize it with mom. What we want to do with mom is be an adult. And that would, by being an adult, we then place her back over on her side of the tennis net, me on my side of the tennis net, and keep the net up. We can still communicate, and the net is porous, but there's still some definition and differentiation there that's going on. And so, um, Jenna, let's assume, uh, and you didn't mention which particular psychological issues that you need to address, um, Let's say uh, she says, you know, I'm just, I, Jenna, I don't, you know, you're really going to have to deal with your depressed attitude or you have low self-esteem. Let's use low self-esteem. 
you know, I just noticed you just have low self-esteem. You might, you need to do something about that, Jenna. And this is mom talking. Then I like to use the circuit breaker, of course, which is the, um, does it bother you? Uh, method to put her on the other side and me on my side of the tennis net. Well, mom, does it bother you? Well, yes, it does. Well, mom, it doesn't bother me. Or if and when I get bothered about it enough, then I'll probably do something about it. And that begins to straighten out that tennis court. If the person would continue, let's say they might, uh, continue and not get that more gentle, though that can feel aggressive too, if you have a dysfunctional family, even though you're just asking for selfhood is all you're asking for, my psychological issues as an adult are mine. If you have some genuine concern, you can voice that, um, but you don't want to keep complaining and, you know, pointing out all of my failings and failures to try to get me to change because I'm going to feel resentful and want to push away from that. Now, I have to deal with my own psychological issues. Um, and so I can, if they keep addressing it, then we have to be more adult. I might feel more resentment. Okay, I got to deal with my resentment with Jerry over there, not with mom, because that's she's not going to get that. And that's probably not going to get her to stop. Mom, I feel so resentful about you doing it. Would you stop doing it? I hate when you do that. That's generally reactivity. <clears throat> and so we don't want to be reactive. And so if they keep doing it, then we have to do the stop. Mom, you must stop talking about this topic. If you don't, I will have to set up more uh, boundaries. I won't be coming by. I won't be talking with you about my psychological issues. That will be off limits to you. So if I, and I need to do that. If they go, no, no, I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep going. Well, then I need to live somewhere else. I'm going to have to go. Now, again, that's, and that may take time. There may be problems with that, but at least that's the direction we would want to go with those kinds of problems. Uh, I've got a, I am getting a couple of questions here. Jackie asks, how do we respond when the narcissist pulls out their bag of tricks? Well, the last thing we'd want to be is surprised. Being surprised is reactivity. I don't want them to have that much power over me. Narcissists will bring out their power, uh, their bag of tricks. That's just what they're going to do. And so uh, we either can take a, uh, well, and that's where we have to uh, set boundaries when they pull out a bag of tricks. Uh, and it's a little hard, Jackie, to answer that question when I don't know which trick they're pulling out uh, because that can make a difference um, because different tricks might require a different approach. Um, if, uh, you know, so because a narcissist can respond in lots of ways with their bag of tricks. Uh, and I certainly believe it's it's important to limit your contact with uh, more unhealthy narcissists um, and that we have to limit our time even with covert narcissists or more uh, less uh, malignant narcissists uh, that we still want to limit because they're not going to change. They're going to have their bag of tricks is going to keep coming. The issue is I want to get that narcissist out of me. I can't make them stop. 
but I want to get the narcissist out of me. And so I need to deal with the negative feelings I have towards them, any positive feelings I might have towards them, any fantasies, and these are all circuit breakers too, any fantasies about the relationship I hope will happen or could happen or my upsetness as to why it hasn't happened, um, that would be a circuit breaker. And um, I need to get that narcissist out of me. So when they pull out their bag of tricks, they the tricks stop at the tennis net. They don't invade me inside internally, emotionally. They stop here at the tennis net. And even becoming confused can be a way to get some, that's another circuit breaker, becoming confused. Even that is a way for us to give us some time to be an adult. Uh, if somebody says, uh, you need to do this, Jerry, and you need to do it now. You know, and if you don't, uh, you're gonna you're gonna suffer. Let's say a narcissist says that, then I would start going, "Wow, that is really confusing," and I would go into a confused state to give myself an opportunity to sort this out. Well, that's very confusing, and I'll get back with you. It stops at the net. I'm going to be confused. I'm not taking it in. I'm observing, not absorbing, which is another circuit breaker, that I'm going to observe, not absorb. I'm hearing what you're saying. I don't like what you're saying. It doesn't make sense what you're saying. It's not adult what you're saying. It's mean. It's narcissistic. I hear all that. So I'm going to say, I don't know why you have to do that other than you are a narcissist. Now, I'm not saying that to them. I'm thinking that in my own mind, that that's why they're doing this. Okay, what do I need to do to protect me? Not what do I need to do to defend myself with them, but to protect me in a healthy way? Or what do I need to do to change them from their meanness or change them from their way of thinking? Because you're going to be spending decades doing that. And then it still won't work. So I want to take care of me at that point. And then I just focus on what's happening on me on the on my side of the tennis net. I'm not going to focus on what's happening on their side of the tennis net. I hope that's some help. Uh, Soren asks, what do we do with people who just want to complain about their lives and not change anything? My sister complains about her husband uh, something child, uh, et cetera, but takes no advice. Um, so, right. And that, well, complainers are, you know, who are complainers? I've been a complainer. So I realize I, I know what it's like to be a complainer. Uh, I used to be one all the time. Now I would try to be a nice Christian pleasant, uh, uh, covert complainer, prayer, prayer, request. prayer request complainer. Uh, those of you who are in the church know some of those know, we, know what we're talking about. And I might do all that, but I, it's still complaint and it's still, rah, 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 I'm not happy about this, not happy about that. Um, and, um, so when you ask Soren, uh, you know, what do we do with those kind of complainers? And I, my mom was a complainer. It's, it's, there's lots of complaining that has gone on in the family. Uh, and I've been a complainer. Uh, and in fact, if you're not a complainer in our family, there's something wrong with you. Uh, so you'll look very odd if you're not. If you're happy, that's, there's something wrong. There's definitely something wrong. Uh, so if you have the complainers like your sister, Soren, um, one of the things I might do, and again, it could feel aggressive or it could feel mean, but if you do it in a calm, 
uh, moving towards her way, it can you can sell it. Uh, be, and that's what you're wanting to do. Because right, really, it's exactly really how I feel. Uh, but it's just we're not used to doing that. So if your sister's complaining about her husband, um, then I would probably say, you know, it, it must be really hard, sis, to live your life. That would be one circuit breaker approach. In other words, I'm looking underneath what's the complaining. The complaining is the poor me, my life is not happy, and I don't, I'm not yet ready to change it. It's not that we can't, though there are some circumstances in which we really can't. I mean, I realize that. I'm as old as I am. I know there's a lot of situations that are not going to change. Um, so sometimes life can be hard. But many times when we're complaining, we're not ready to make those changes. Um, and so I want to address, oh, it must be, you know, your life is really tough. You know, and, um, you know, I'm sorry to hear that. So we give them compassion in which we take the complaining and give them something that's underneath what the real problem is. Because they are needy. They're dependent. They're, they have learned helplessness. So I'm going to be kind and I can do that. And then many times that will throw them for a loop because if they're complaining, you're supposed to help them get out of it. And I'm not choosing to help them get out of it. I'm just saying that is really tough. Wow. That I just, wow. That leaves her on her side of the tennis net, me on my side of the tennis net. And I'm going, man, it must be horrible over there, sis. But you're over there and I'm over here. And I'm not going to jump over the net and save you. I can't. So there's no sense giving advice. There's no sense... You know, because they're not going to take it. You've probably given advice a thousand times and, and they don't change because they're not ready. <coughs> now, if sis, um, oops, I think we lost our. Uh, Is it fuzzy? It's fuzzy. I don't see if we fuzzy, can. Fuzzy, fuzzy, fuzzy. I, where? There, I got it. I, <laughs> I, I got to moving too much. Okay. The uh, So if sis keeps complaining, then. We can, we can be a little more, um, we can be a little more, how I want to say, um, strategic. And if somebody's complaining, you know, then I might say, you know, you can, sis, you complain about your husband and, uh, and child a lot. And that does worry me. And I wonder in what way that works or helps you in some way. I'm just curious. Uh, not that I want you to be unhappy or want you to be unhappy with your husband or your kids or that life's not tough, but I just wonder. Now that's a little more helpful if you want to be helpful. In other words, I'm moving towards the tennis net a little more in doing that. Here's the net, and I'm moving that way, but I haven't quite jumped all the way over yet. To jump all the way over the net to her would be, and this is what you need to do. Now I've jumped over the net, and now I'm all in, in her stuff, and now we're enmeshed. So it, you have to be tricky how far, you have to be careful how far you go up to the net. But I like the, you know, I'm just so sorry to hear, hear that. It must be really difficult. And in some way, you know, we've talked about narcissists and supply. Uh, complainers and uh, learned helpless people need supply too. And who do they need? They need someone to feel sorry for them. They need someone to try to help them, which they will reject and not do. 
And so they need that supply. So they come to you and go, oh, let me tell you about all my problems and everything going on. I got to tell you, because I hope you will try to kick into over-functioning so I can stay under-functioning. I need you to kick in your over-functioning for me. Well, I don't, you know, good luck. Good luck over-functioning and getting them out of it. I don't think it's going to... Um, I just don't think it's going to help to do that. Uh, Soren, I hope that helps some. And that is difficult. We have lots of family members who complain. And we have co-workers. I have co-workers that would complain all the time. You know, and it's like, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, you're looking for something. You may want to look for it a different way. And, of course, you can always say, when someone complains to you, that sounds like a great topic for your therapist. That's another circuit breaker. Do the referral. That sounds like a great thing for you to talk to with your pastor. That sounds like a great thing. That's what I, and don't you think when I sit on an airplane, somebody says, hey, Jerry, what do you do for a living? Guess what they're going to say? They're going to have problems and complain. And I'll go, boy, that's exactly you need are the topics you need to talk to someone about. Because they have to be willing to and ready to get some help. Otherwise, I'm just wasting my time. Uh, I'm just wasting my time trying to help or trying to. I'm better off doing the referral than helping them. A referral can be much more help. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm not even sure what that is. Mark. Uh, I know what it is. I think they, she said it was actually a question for me. Oh, oh, okay. So sorry for that. Okay, that's okay. I'm sorry. I, I wasn't sure about that. <laughs> I wasn't yeah. sure how to answer that one. <laughs> I can make up an answer. I, I'm good at making up answers. Um, and sometimes they're even helpful. Uh, I thought while we're getting some more questions, uh, I wanted to share with you an example of uh, circuit breaking um, life like in marriage. I had a couple and uh, they're from Ireland. And I work with them. They're a wonderful couple, lovely people, uh, imperfect like everybody else, uh, very talented, smart folks. And and I um, the oh, that's a great question. We'll get to that question here in a minute. Um, and and I was working with them, and in fact, working with the husband. His name is Jack. We'll call her Joan, Joan and Jack. And um, I was working with Jack and Jack was aware of and began to see with uh, a little more systems eyes. And I think he had watched my uh, recent video, The um, Calmness is Everything. That's about an hour and 47 minutes worth of some, I think, some gems in there that could be of help to anyone. If you want to look on my YouTube channel or on Family Tree Brand Life Coaches channel or Jerry Wise Relationship Systems channel uh, to look at uh, calmness is everything. And I do give you some more uh, circuit breakers because we want those circuit breakers. And circuit breakers are the things we do to be non-reactive. That's what we want because there's a surge of electricity, surge of emotionality, and we want to we want to eliminate and reduce that surge, and and how it affects our limbic system and how we become reactive. Uh, back to Jack and Joan. So. Um, Joan and her mom, uh, Joan's mom has been kind of problematic, maybe a little more narcissistic. Uh, Jack's family is kind of narcissistic and kind of codependent, very enme or enmeshed. Uh, 
enmeshed. And there's enmeshment on uh, Jones family too. And so um, there have been times when Jones' mom has been reactive over nothing and misunderstood things. And Jack, who is the uh, son-in-law, he tries to help. He's tried to overfunction. He's tried to do all kinds of things to make up to Jones' mom. But Jones' mom will always find fault. Uh, I think she kind of likes being in between Jack and Joan. And Joan recognizes some of that, and Joan sees some of that. And uh, one of the things they noticed was when Joan has communication with her mom or visits with her or goes with her, uh, and then they come back, Joan is highly charged, which then creates uh, a highly charged situation in which Jack becomes highly charged. They then get into an argument and they start pinging one another. And it starts, you know, and I'm not there to blame Joan's mother. I'm not there to blame Joan. I'm not there to blame Jack. I'm just saying this is what tends to happen. Uh, it can go the other way. It could be Jack who's upset by something or someone and he brings it home because we bring home the pinging. If you get pinged at your family of origin, if you get pinged with your parents, if you get pinged with your sister and brother or your family or at work or at church or wherever, we tend to bring it home even if we're not thinking about it. We still have the reactivity going on inside. Um, and so uh, she comes home. They then tend to get in an argument. They ping it back and forth. So we began to plot that out and see where we could put in some uh, circuit breakers. And one of the things he could do to put in a circuit breaker of if she comes home from mom and mom sends out all this toxic energy, reactivity, criticism, even if it's unspoken. It doesn't even have to be spoken. It's just that energy of, of negativity. And then it comes home. If he recognizes that or is prepared for that, then he can be able to put up a circuit breaker for himself, not take uh, what's being said or done so personally, also takes, uh, what do you call it when you're in a, ship evasive action he can take evasive action when the circuit or torpedo of pinging comes from mom to joan then back home to jack and he can take evasive action and that is one of the circuit breakers which is to uh take a step back and to the side back and to the side so that the torpedo goes on by you so that the pinging goes on beside you and that's what i used to mean when i talked about the uh, matador uh how do matadors survive not getting gored by the bull they use a cape and they hold the cape right in front of them right no i wouldn't do that because the bull is going to target the red cape. The matador doesn't hold the cape in front of them. The matador holds the cape to the side so that it goes right on through and not through them. So we take one step back into the side. And so he then was learning to take one step back into the side and not let whatever's happening with mom um, come home and at least not affect him. Now, she, she still may be pinged, but we're not. We're going to break the circuit breaker right here. And he can make a decision about that and be strategic about that. And that has been very helpful for them to do that. And so now mom has less control and impact on their marriage. Um, there's a book that I think that's kind of what she... Uh, kind of talks about, it's called um, the, 
let's see, what would I say? Uh, the, oh, It Takes One to Tango by Winifred Riley, I think. I should have that. I should have that name, but it's It Takes One to Tango. That I know is the title of it. And she's talking about someone understanding systems and using that in their own marriage, whether the other spouse is cooperating or not, because you still have uh, currency, you still have purchase, you still have power and empowerment within a system. Um, believe it or not, and I know this will be controversial, I'm sure, no one is completely powerless in a system. Now, I know you're going to write all kinds of things. Yes, Jerry, there are. I certainly know there are people who are abused, misused, tortured. But I understand all that goes on. So, I, And if someone's holding a gun to me, I'm not sure I have lots of power. I mean, I, I guess I could still run. You know, I might if I knew jujitsu or... <clears throat> martial arts, I might be able to do something. But if I don't, then I'm somewhat powerless at this point. I'm in the control of the other person. But in most relationship systems, there's not zero power or zero empowerment. And I think that's something we want to remember that <clears throat> even if we're supply for someone, we are at least supply for someone. That's some power. So I, I don't want us to forget that we have power even in bad systems. Uh, we could have a whole night on talking about what do you do with that power. And maybe we can have a talk on that sometime. So anyway, Jack and Joan were helped by that, uh, talking about the circuit breakers. Um, then I have a question. Is it ever an appropriate time for a healthy person to jump over the net to help someone? Or should we never give advice and give compassion and empathy instead? And I think that's a great question. Um, it, is, it is never inappropriate to give advice to help someone um, as long as you're doing it intentionally, not neurotically, unconsciously, but intentionally. And for example, if I'm Jenna's mother and I would like to give her some advice, let's say, or, or, or share with her about emotional or psychological issues, I can do that intentionally, but I don't want to do it out of a system well, I'm your mother. I have a right to tell you all these things. That's not intentional. That's just systemic dysfunction. You know, and she's she's not doing it. She's doing it for herself, not for her daughter. More than likely. Uh, she wants her daughter to not be psychologically unhealthy so she'll be okay. It's different if you go to your daughter and say, I want to tell you, I'm very, very concerned about you. Can I, interventions, for example, are an intentional advice giving. And with those kinds of illnesses of addictions, some mental illnesses, alcoholism, you need that intentional uh, intervention that actually goes over on their side of the net because they're at the end of the cliff. When someone's at the end of the cliff, I'm not so worried about the net. I, I, the net doesn't bother me quite so much uh, if someone's at the cliff. But even sometimes if somebody's at the, at the cliff, which is very scary, we sometimes have to stay on our side of the net. And boy, is that tough. And I worked with alcoholic and addict families for years and how difficult that was for them to let them go. Uh, because them holding on wasn't getting them help. Them letting go uh, uh, is more likely to get them help. But boy, it's scarier than all get out to do that. And so is it appropriate? Yes, we can as healthy people give. Um, I, can, 
I can give someone a monetary gift if I do it intentionally, not because I feel guilty, not so I will please God or make him love me more, because that's not why I would do it. Um, and that I do it out of intention. I There's no strings attached. And again, my advice, if I jump over to help someone, my advice or help doesn't have strings attached. Generally, when people jump over those nets, there's strings attached. There are no strings attached if I help. So certainly I believe in helping our brother, helping our neighbor, helping absolutely. But I also do not want to um, help when they are able to do it themselves. Then again, I'm jumping over the net. I can help someone when they can't do it themselves and I choose to give that help. But I'm not guilted into it. I'm not, ooh, well, you know, I'm... Uh, you know, I, I can even remember, well, I'm not going to go into all that. So, yes, I think there are, yet yeah, we certainly can give advice, be helpful, but we do it humbly and we do it intentionally, not neurotically, not automatically. Do it intentionally. And we know the full uh, consequences. Number one, they may not like me. If I do an intervention, they may not like me. But I do it intentionally because I know that's the higher good. Um, and I do it intentionally, not automatically. I don't do it because I want to save someone. I do it because I care and love someone. Uh, I don't know that we can save anybody. But we can love someone and care about them. And to the point where I can go and, 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 and offer my help or give my help. But it's not to make me feel better. It's not to fix my life. It's not ma to make me feel more in control. It's not for them beholding to me. It has nothing to do with that. It's my mature. So we can maturely sacrifice ourselves uh, for others. I think Jesus is a good example. He didn't give up his life um, because he felt guilty. He didn't give up his life to be somebody he wasn't. He gave up his life willingly, intentionally, for the purposes that were his values, his beliefs, and uh, what he believed to be important. That's why he gave up his life. No one made him do it. Um, and um, now we can talk about all the theology of that and the Trinity and but I'm just saying that it was a willing, sacrificial choice. And hey, if somebody's doing that and they know the pluses and minuses and they want to go uh, serve the poor, then go and do it. Absolutely. Let's see here. Oh, that's a good that, That's a whole session in and of itself with that question. Oh, is there? A... And this is a tough one. This is difficult. Morrison. Uh, I am currently living with a narcissistic abuser. My son and his mother have nowhere to go. She is stealing all my energy and joy. Um, is there a circuit breaker for this? Well, I think there's many circuit breakers, and they're not easy if you have to live with someone. That is that is not easy at all. Caring for yourself is a circuit breaker. Getting a break is a circuit breaker. Uh, doing more of what you need to do for you is a circuit breaker. Um, you know, c coming to terms with... How long are you going to continue to do this? Uh, are you able to do this uh, for a long period of time? And, and that can be a very tough choice to make. Uh, 
And I remember even in my own life with my own granddaughter and just how difficult it was. What do I do with her when she has a mother <coughs> or a father who's not functioning very well? And I can't control it. And, and it becomes just wildly crazy. And I can't save the situation. Even legally, I can't save it. I'm the grandfather. I'm not the father. I'm not the mother. So there was a time I'm basically, uh, you know, powerless other than having power over me. And so what I wanted to do and the circuit breaker I used was I'm going to work on having more power over me, regulating my own feelings and emotions, taking care of me. And this may be a situation in which you're called to have courage to do that even more. And that's not easy when you're living with someone who's a narcissistic abuser. Uh, certainly the idea would be get away from her. Well, that's not always, you know, they don't have anywhere to go. Right. What do we do in that instance? And uh, but I think what I would do also as a circuit breaker is find someone for you to talk to. Uh, I don't think you should not be alone. Find a coach, find a therapist that you can talk to during this difficult time, a pastor, someone who could help you, uh, a recovery group, uh, a CODA group, a Codependents Anonymous, uh, ACOA group, whatever would be appropriate for you. Find a group. Al-Anon is another uh, good group that can be of help. If you can't afford coaching or therapy, Al-Anon is a group you could go and, and say, hey, I've got this, you know. And, and narcissistic abuse is, is as bad as alcohol life, very similar. Um, and so you want to have support. Uh, and there are probably other uh, circuit breakers uh, that would be available. Uh, I can't think of any right now, but I'm sure there are, are more. I am hoping to do a video that would include a whole gaggle and a whole list of circuit breakers. Uh, I put some of them in the calmness is everything, but there's probably 20 more. And I'd like to do a video where I have, and I'm planning on doing a video where I have many more circuit breakers so we have more tools because people are always asking me about tools and so i'd like to offer them um, more um, i wonder if okay well here's if i could maybe i could end with this question um, how do I stay focused on not having reactivity in an interaction while also letting go of the need to address the other person's reactions or behaviors that, that feel wrong to me? Thank you very much, Jerry. See you tonight. Um, so how do I say focus on not having reactivity um, in an interaction while, while uh, letting go of the need to address the other person's reactions? As I've said in previous broadcasts, the, the answer is in the question. And if you read that question, and, and I know I've asked many questions where my answers were already in the question. So I, I don't have a name here, I don't think, uh, for who this came from. Um, the, the, where, where I let go of the need to address the other person's reactions or behaviors that feel wrong to you. All of that statement is enmeshment. That's all enmeshment, those last words that I just mentioned. And so we're enmeshed with them and we find ourselves jumping over on their side of the tennis net because we can't let their behavior go. We, we can't, they, it's been negative, so I can't just, I can't let it go. And so that not being able to let it go will keep you reactive. 
you will keep the reactivity going uh, as we are focusing on their wrong behavior. And what I like to do is stay on my side of the tennis net, not focus on their wrong behavior, though I might mention, and it depends on what the circumstance is, of course, because this would vary depending upon what wrong behavior they're doing that might feel wrong to you. Uh, if they're throwing a knife at me, that can have a different reaction from me than if someone's calling me a jerk. Uh, that might be, or, or my mother saying I need a haircut. All those would have varying degrees of what I might respond. Now, I think all of those situations are inappropriate, but they're inappropriate at different levels. And so uh, I might want to have a response to some, or I would have a response to someone in which I would say, well, I don't like that or that's what, not how I feel, or I think what you've shared with me is uh, inappropriate. Um, and I think I need to uh, exit at this point. So I need to go because I'm not going to stay and be reactive. I'm going to identify what I'm not happy with what you've just said, but I'm not going to get into why they said it, how they should have said it, what was wrong with them, or do a psychoanalysis on them. Uh, that's probably not going to help unless they're asking me for that. But if they don't ask me for that, I'm not going to offer that. Um, if we feel caught and we need to address the reactions of others, then we're enmeshed. I'm going to leave them on the other side of the tennis net, and they are free to have as many reactions as they want. They can, they can have all the emotional current running through them they'd like. I'm over here on my side. I'm not going to get in between that. And if you start trying to address their behavior or uh, uh, or their reactions, then you're going to get caught in between the circuit and it's going to energize you. So I'm going to stay out of it. So if somebody says, <coughs> um, you know, I just don't think you're being a very good parent, Jerry. You, you know, you took your son to soccer and you just left him there. I don't know. I don't know why you would do that. No parent I know would do that. Well, that's an interesting perspective, and I'm not sure you have all of the facts. Um, I'm going to go get a Coke. I, I'm not going to deal with their reactivity. I'm not going to deal with their reactions because, again, we're back to Coca-Cola life. I mean, you don't know why I left my son there. Maybe there was a fire and I ran off to, you know, you don't know. And you're making judgments about me you should not make. So that's a problem. And, uh, and I want to stay out of other people's reactivity. Always stay out of other people's reactivity. Stay on your stinking side of the tennis net. And, and that's a hard lesson. It, it's very hard. I've been working on this for 40 years. You know, it's not easy to stay on this side of the tennis net. But it is, pays off a lot better, let me tell you that. And it doesn't mean I don't engage people or I don't care about people. It doesn't mean that. It just means I'm able to more be myself <coughs> than get all wrapped up with them. Well, I think we have just about come to the end of our time. I want to thank everyone for sending in questions tonight. Uh, I hope you will <coughs> join uh, my email list by signing up at www.jerrywiserelationshipsystems.com or you can email me, and I think we'll have that below underneath the, the video. Um, 
and uh, you could also join this YouTube channel. You can also join my YouTube channel at Jerry Wise Relationship Systems. Uh, I've got a new video that I'm going to be doing. I'll be heading out west to do a new video, much like the uh, calmness is everything, as everything. Uh, and it'll be an interesting topic uh, about that chronic and systems anxiety. And someone has asked me to do that, so I'm going to do that. That'll be here in uh, September, maybe early to middle September. Um, I just want to thank all of you for joining tonight and sending in your questions. Uh, I've answered as many questions as I could this evening. I tried to look over some of the questions people had sent me before the broadcast, which I appreciate. Um, I do have some workshops that you can purchase on Vimeo, uh, Jerry Wise On Demand. Um, and uh, I want to thank Mark Smith for joining me tonight and helping me, being a wingman, to help me with the questions. He's the guy. And uh, I thank him for letting me take his chair occasionally and bring some information to you that might be of help to you, I hope. Um, so I want to wish all of you a great week and I hope you have a great evening and, uh, thank you for watching. Where's the end button? Oh, there's the, here it is. How many therapists does it take? To <laughs> That's right. <laughs> to do the...